Hello and welcome to episode 81 of the Arena Regulars podcast. I'm Zach. And I'm Jeff. And we're your source for weekly drunken Magic the Gathering arena content. That's right. Basically just two regular dudes drinking some irregular beer and talking about Magic the Gathering. In particular, the online client MTG Arena. And we're on video. This is our first yeah. video podcast. Um, so, you know, 80 episodes down, all audio, but now we're on a new frontier, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, um, this is an epic experiment. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of times when we want to edit something out but can't. So uh, we'll figure it out. We, we will yeah, figure you guys it out. are along, um, along with us for the ride. <laughs> Uh, if you're not listening to it or watching us right now, go to youtube.com uh, slash arena regulars to find our faces and all the, the things we're doing. This week, we're going to be talking a bit about Explorer because there was a qualifier weekend. So it seems like the, um, the format or the meta has shifted just a little bit and is starting to settle in. So we'll get to that. But first, each week, we both bring a beer. We drink Jeff's, then drink mine, rate them on a scale of bronze to mythic, choose the best for last. So with that, Jeff... What's on tap? All right. I brought something fun this time. It's called a Ruby Social. Again, if you're uh, watching on YouTube, you can see it. If you're just listening, uh, it's kind of a crazy looking red can here. It looks like some sort of wedding, but there's a skeleton there as well. Skeleton? Yep. <laughs> and this is a strawberry rhubarb wit beer. I thought I'd throw Zach a curveball because I read strawberry rhubarb. I'm like, oh, no, that's this beer Zach's going to love. But then it's a wit beer, so I was like, you know, I'm not sure how he's going to feel about this. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so why don't we crack it in? Crack it open here. Crack it in, perfect. That's right. Here we go. Uh, uh, it's already starting. It's already starting. Um, nice, Upstreet. I don't know if I've had anything from these folks, but no, I've never had. Let's see. Either. I do kind of like the picture on it. It has like New Capena vibes, like they're some That's sort true. of cabaret yeah. party. Right. Yeah, totally. All right. I got this kind of rose mm. gold color here. Yeah, quite nice in our mugs. That's right. <laughs> anyway, Jeff, we have some magic news. Um, actually, there isn't a lot of magic news. It was just the qualifier tournament this weekend, but there's all this like double master stuff going around all these previews for the set that's coming out and boy am i just happy to be an arena player who doesn't have to deal with any of those it means absolutely nothing to me it's great <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly like <clears throat> there's just so many sets these days that if you if you have to keep up with all of them it's so much so it's mm. nice if you sort of pick a lane and and you know care about the sets you care about you know commander players get excited for the commander products we get excited for the stuff that's actually going to change arena um it just means there's a few sets that you don't have to follow all the previews and go through that whole set fatigue so uh, double masters is that double masters too while i'm sure it's a great set for a lot of people is is kind of that for me yeah um i feel exactly the same way like reprints great I'm probably not going to be able to draft the format and I'm just doesn't mean a lot. So um, with whenever there is a moment where I can take a breath and all the set fatigue, I'm very happy that this is one of those moments. All right. So getting right into things and Explorer. Uh, so Jeff, do you want to tell us a little bit just about this website first that we're going to be talking about um, as we're looking through it? Because you happen to find it. Yeah, that's right. So this is called Playing Explorer. Now, there was a website called Playing Pioneer that was basically, I guess, the go-to place for Pioneer deck lists, for tier lists, et cetera, et cetera, um, like descriptions of how a deck works and so on. And naturally, when Explorer came around, they decided to have Playing Explorer, which is playingpioneer.com uh, slash Playing Explorer. Or if you just search Playing Explorer, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, but because, you know, Pioneer and Explorer are similar and probably intended to converge at some point it made sense for these people to, to go into it. And I've really liked mm -hmm. playing Explorer it just has a tier list that they update every single week. So, you know, there are some other tier lists you'll find out there, but I find they tend to just kind of have some random decks in them and it hasn't been updated in a long time. And so some deck that was, 
seems to be good maybe at the start of the format when the set just dropped is like still labeled as tier one uh this one is not going to do that to you it's updated every single week and they their tier list is like a blend of how good the deck is with how often it's played so um it's it really is like a measure oh. of what to what you ex can expect to play against on the ladder so if there's some deck that's like really high and you don't think it's that good it's probably played a lot and if there's some deck that's you think is good, but it's kind of low on their list. It probably is because not that many people are playing it. Nice. Okay. I like that. That makes it a lot easier to to see because sometimes you're looking at tier lists and you're like, okay, well, this seems like the best deck, but then everything I'm playing seems to be like really low on this list. I don't know what's going on. Um, so that seems really helpful. Yeah. So if a deck just starts taking over on the ladder, next week it'll be moved up, right? So nice. you'll... You know, you can only ever be a week out of date. And I think I read that they update on Thursdays. So uh, those of you watching slash listening to this, uh, you probably just got an update to this tier list. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this may be <laughs> perfect. I'm glad. Yeah. They, right off the bat, let's get yeah. let's be talking about the, all that, the new it's, stuff, right? It's going to be completely <laughs> different than what we're talking about. <laughs> oh my god perfect all right maybe we'll just upload this on wednesday instead <laughs> so yeah, you get at least how, one that's day. how we get ahead of it that's perfect um jeff let's start off uh talk about the the s tier the best deck that is in explorer right now and i don't think it's really changed since we've talked about this last um but rakdos midrange <sighs> yeah <laughs> I guess the thing to like <laughs> mention about since last we talked is just that this deck is still here. Like a lot of the time, mid range decks with a lot of different answers um, start out the format really strong because other decks haven't figured out their lists yet, and it's really easy to like mm -hmm. put all the best cards in a deck and have a strong deck. And so it really preys on people who have suboptimal lists if just every single card in your deck is a two for one. Um, but the deck's still here, so that indicates to me that it, it actually is a real deck. It's not just sort of, hey, playing all the good cards beats people who are playing really bad decks. It's This deck is just, a, like, good in the format. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anything, like, it's just full of two-for-ones, and just the card quality is so strong. Um, and, well, the one thing that draws me to this is, is I've been playing Coligan's Command, and anytime I can kind of squeeze that into something... It's just so I love much fun. Come here. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but the list that we're looking at is actually running Rekindling Phoenix, which I'm really interested in seeing. I don't know if I've actually seen this card in these these lists, but to be fair, um, this deck tends to uh, destroy me fairly fairly quickly. <laughs> so um, I like to see a lot of the deck. To be fair, they don't need too many cards against me. <laughs> Yeah, this. I mean, this deck is good. Uh, I've seen Rekindling Phoenix kind of popping up, and I think that's mm -hmm. interesting. I'm not sure what it's targeting, like what deck it's supposed to be good against. Maybe it's, uh, like I was going to say, you'd think maybe Control or something, but Control plays a lot of Exile effects, um, mm -hmm. like Wandering Emperor that's true. Exiles and uh, Farewell. March, March of whatever and March. March. Um, yeah, otherworldly, and uh, and farewell also exile. So that is true. Not totally wonder... sure what it's for, but uh, it's a good card. It is a good card. Um, I like having the one of that is quite nice. Um, and of course, we're playing a ton of Thoughtseize and a ton of Fable <laughs> of the Mirror Breaker. You know, actually, it could just be for the mirror match, right? Like it's all. This is all uh, destroy based removal in this deck mm -hmm. and so all of the eggs like the all of the graveyard exile is also sorcery speed so it forces you to like kill it and then animate your hive of the eye tyrant and attack and exile it i don't know it's uh yeah that is true and it does have three toughness so it doesn't die to a bunch of the the Stomp. you know all the the stomps and and like we were saying coligan's command so I can definitely see that. And if it's the best, you know, you main deck your hate against the the best deck, which is yourself. So that does make sense. Yeah. I don't mind this deck being the best either. 
um, because it, it's beatable, right? It's not just like if you're not playing red black, you're doing something wrong. Um, I think a lot of its strength comes from being pretty decent against a lot of different things, but it, it definitely has some weaknesses. Like, you know, <clears throat> there's a certain deck that we're going to be talking about after the break that uh, that we're, we've been playing a lot of, and I almost never lose to red black with that deck. So. It just shows that like this deck does have weak matchups and you can build decks that are good against it. It's just like, are the decks that are good against this necessarily going to be the strongest decks in the format? It's hard to say. And this deck can always win. There's ne never going to be like a 0% matchup because it has answers for everything. At, at worst, it can like thought seize away whatever you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. Traditionally, decks that are good against this are like, big mana land type decks and we don't really have those in the format so you know yeah. there's no there's no like mono green devotion that they have in pioneer that just has makes so much mana and, and dumps its hand in the first three turns that you know make these two for ones kind of irrelevant there's nothing like that right now so this deck if you want to beat it you got to kind of go over the top of it um but there's mm -hmm. plenty of options to do that yeah, that's right. The one other thing I just want to say um, specifically about playing Explorer, this website we're using, is that they do have the best of one and best of three, um, the lists right next to each other. So it's very easy to compare them as opposed to some other places. It seems a little bit more difficult. So uh, if you are a best of one player, this is a great website for you as well. Being able to see right. it back to back. I do like that, right. especially when you see some differences. But anyway. I think they have a separate best of one tier list as well. So you can just... Um, but yeah, it's really nice that we came here through the best of three tier list. We clicked on red, black, and then we get to see both versions. Uh, side by side. Wanna, yeah, see the differences. I do have one gripe with red, black decks. Um, I just cannot believe, I just don't believe you when you tell me that Blood Tithe Harvester is the best thing that we can be doing in this archetype in Explorer. There's just no, no better two drop to be playing than Blood Tithe Harvester. I, I, gotta I think say, that card. <laughs> that card. I don't get it. Yeah. I I I like it. I like Blood Tithe Harvester. I mean, it's so mediocre. It is, but it's still annoying enough that like it, having the blood around, having the the three two as a real threat that's attacking you, and um, if you're playing a slower deck, knowing that you have to do something about this card that you think is terrible and having blood tokens which help fill your graveyard for Kroxa has been good enough that I'm like maybe I don't hate it and now I kind of like it every time I play against it I'm just like so underwhelmed by it and I just have a hard time believing that there's not a better two drop or a better thing to be doing like this deck doesn't use this deck uses the blood token okay it turns on fatal push I guess it's sort of Mm -hmm. Like you said, fills the graveyard for Croxa. Um, I guess you can make the argument that copying it with Fable of the Mirror Breaker can be good in, in some situations. But none of those things are that good. <laughs> and it's just like, I don't know, a 3-2? It, it's, it's always felt like a 3-2 to me. And I'm just like, can the deck yeah. that's just all good cards, this really makes the cut of like best red-black cards in the past 10 years or whatever? I'm just not buying it. But that's one of the two best mana, red black cards in the past 10 years. Two mana, three power creatures, man. Mm. I mean, okay, so would you... It dies if, to if stomp, playing... which is the most played removal spell in the format. <laughs> like, that's if true, you drop like... this, your opponent just, like, stomps it on end step. Sure, but you got a blood token. <laughs> <laughs> you don't use the blood so... token well, that's what I'm saying. It's not like you're an anvil <laughs> deck, you know? You're or not like, using yeah, that you're... it's a vampire, you're not really using the blood token. It's too it's it's too mediocre. I'm I'm just saying I think the end form of this deck will not involve this card. Um, it can't even I... like, kill something right away. If it could kill something right away, I'd be sold. Like you play it and you you kill their land war elf then that would be enough versatility for me. But because you have to kill it next turn, the Land of Warhoff has already ramped them into the card they wanted. And it's just like, I just, I don't know. There's got to be something better. And th th this is like an automatic four of in every deck. I find a little mind-boggling. I don't think it's <laughs> that good. 
I, I agree. Okay. I, yes, I agree that maybe four of an every deck, it's not that great, but I still think it's pretty good. I still like it. I'm going to, I'm going to like I, take a look isn't... tomorrow. I'm just going to come up with like five cards that I think are better. <laughs> Two drops. All right. All right. We'll put that in our discord. And, but I'm already uh, interested listening... in like bloodthirsty adversary as an option over this thing. I know we play a lot of creatures, but still stuff like that. Right. Sure. Okay. That is, I've seen lists that are playing that card. So, um, that does seem a bit better. Maybe two and two, you know, just, to, just spice it up. <laughs> now, yeah. see, my my goal you... is to get rid of all four copies of this card. <laughs> yeah. But you can use the blood token to discard <laughs> the spell you want to play with the bloodthirsty adversary. So there you go. <laughs> Actually, the most common use I've seen for blood tokens is to discard blood tithe harvesters that you draw late. <laughs> 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 Good thing I had this Blood Tithe Harvester early so I can discard the extra copies later. Yeah, because this card stinks, <laughs> so I want a new one. <laughs> I don't know. I still think it's pretty okay, but um, it's definitely you also okay. play a lot more. It's definitely okay. <laughs> All right, perfect. Well, let's um, let's move I into I also another... raise an eyebrow at Soren, but don't get me into that. I think Soren's pretty me mediocre, too. Yeah, I actually, I agree with that. I think Soren's really not my favorite. I should take it out of more lists that I play because I never am that happy about it. Um, but anyway, like, let's move on we, to another... Why aren't we playing four Chandra before we're going to three plus one? But anyways. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to another Rakdos list. Um, the Anvil one. That's Okay, so in this deck, do you like Blood Tide Harvester in Rakdos Anvil? I don't, I don't even play it in my version of this. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Not even... But I, wow. I am okay. more willing to accept it in this. But... The list is really tight. You want like four of a mm -hmm. lot of different things. And for me, Blood Tithe, uh, like I'd rather play more one drops than that. That's usually why it gets cut because it's a two drop. Uh, that makes sense. And, you know, double color and you're already trying to do double color with um, you'd much rather play your, your anvil uh, takes up that spot. That makes sense. And this list is agreeing with you and has none of them. So, yeah, yeah this list is pretty similar like to what I do. Um, mm -hmm. I don't play any Croxa either, though. But... Yeah. I, mean, oh, I think you know, the, like... Uh, I you like Croxa to build too. the deck. Do you like Croxa? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I like Croxa as a card. It's just so hard to find slots in this deck, because you want... Like, look at this list. It's not even playing four cats, which, uh, to me, is crazy. But you need, like... Okay, you got your cat, you got your oven, then you got Anvil, then you have to play uh, Mayhem Devil you're pretty much always going to see four experimental synthesizers. Like, we're already up to just 20 mm -hmm. cards, right? Um, Thoughtseize, okay, I don't play Thoughtseize main deck in mine. But Fatal Push mm -hmm. is pretty much a must-have. You're going to have some number of meat hooks. I think two is pretty common. Like, we're already up to 26, and if you count Thoughtseize, 30 cards that are, like, auto-includes. So all of your flex slots, you have very little room to play. So that's why you see, like, oh, one Croxa... Uh, some people play mm -hmm. one Obnixilis because they just, it's like whatever red black card you kind of like sort of takes that, those last few yeah. spots. I don't know. Oh, I like, Deadly Dispute, I mean, sorry, Deadly Dispute's an automatic four of. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, mm -hmm. I think the not playing all four Cauldron Familiars is quite interesting and then having the, the Kroxa in there just because... When you have, like, tell me if I'm wrong, but, like, Witches Oven team seems to be more important as far as, like, the combo. When you have multiple Witches Ovens, it's a lot yeah. more helpful to have one cat and multiple ovens than it is to have multiple cats in one oven. So That's definitely I can see true. That, but <laughs> you want to get the cat little, as... Yeah. This deck is a little Go weird. Go ahead, sorry. This deck's mm -hmm. a little weird because it doesn't play that many creatures. So... The Witch's Oven is, is less good on its own than it is has been in traditional, like, Jund or, okay. like, you know, like, Jund Sack kind of thing. Because in Jund Sack, it's like, oh, I, I play a goose, I get the food out of it, maybe I get another food, and then they try to kill it, and I sack it with my Witch's Oven, that type of stuff. This deck has very few creatures. Mm -hmm. So the Oven is actually, like, honestly, you sack it to Anvil a lot more than you think you would to get your artifact train going. Um, mm hmm and so it's still the more important part of the combo, for sure. Like, which is oven. You know, when two Cauldron Familiars in an oven does nothing, really, and two ovens in a Cauldron Familiar doubles the combo. Mm -hmm. But it's still, like, 
oven is not that good without familiar. It's sort of like a, just a two card combo in this particular deck, whereas usually oven is just much better than familiar. And so mm -hmm. I, I think most decks I, I understand four and three, but in this deck, I think you just want to maximize having both because they kind of both suck without the other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I can, I mean, Obviously, if I'm playing this deck, I would probably play four of all of them because I wouldn't think of a reason why not to. Yeah. It just it makes me excited to see someone who is like, you know what? We don't have to play all four of both. Let's see what else we can play. And so I like that. Hey, um, yeah, good, good job. I've seen people I just the not, name. Even, not even play the combo. Really? Why yeah. would you? Why? Why would you do that? <laughs> I think it's because each card individually is not that good in the deck, but still, like, Mm -hmm. The combo is so good that, you know, when you That's have the combo this... going, you're like, Anvil gets you free artifact sacks from the cat coming back and sacking the food mm -hmm. and stuff. Like, you should probably be playing the combo in this deck. But I've seen people omit it. Uh, or, or maybe I just that get just... really lucky and they don't draw either piece in all three games. <laughs> that seems, yeah. Or they side it out, strangely. Hey. Um, weird. Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I think that this is the reason you play. Obviously, you play these kind of sacrifice decks because the synergy is so strong. So why would you get rid of the most, the strongest synergy that you have? Yeah, I don't, I don't get that. But this deck is anyway. weak to everything you think it's weak to. It's weak to artifact hate um, because, mm -hmm. like, picking off. They they really have a few key pieces to get their engines going. So you know, Colagon's command looks good here. Uh, Boseju, stuff like that, uh, just blowing up anvils or blowing mm -hmm. up the oven is what stops the combo. So, yeah, if you want to beat this deck, you can. You just you need to you need to get on the board early, and then you also need to be able to destroy artifacts and you know some stuff like gaining life Disrupt doesn't them. hurt because if you gain life, they really just don't have a clock to beat you. Um, mm -hmm. Like they're so slow at killing you. But they do, they sort of do it inevitably. That's that's their yeah. their thing. And so if you can gain life, it really buys you a lot of time. So that type of stuff's really good against them too. Yeah. Yep, those are most of the things I would try to do. Although I'm not playing my normal um, kind of Azorius against this. But anyway, um, w while we're talking about Rakdos Anvil, maybe we should also just talk about Jund Food so we can get all of it done. Uh, get all the cats. Just get all the cats talked about. Um, yeah. We can finish all those decks. Um, so another A tier list here. Uh, did we even mention mm -hmm. that we moved down to A tier? S tier is just Rakdos Midrange. That, that's a good thing to mention. Hey, <laughs> Rakdos Midrange is the best deck. And then <laughs> the A tier has four decks. Two of them are food decks that, that are playing with the cat and the oven. Uh, so right. we're moving into Jund Food, which is our more classical look at what we're, we're fairly used to in Historic uh, with this deck. Yeah, the specific list they have linked here is like a mashup. It's like Oni Cult Anvil. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has Karn in it, which I, I played a little bit against. Um, but I, I find mostly I I what did. I run into online is the more traditional like version. Like I'm not mm -hmm. seeing Corvold in this list, and, and online that's I'm, what I've I'm been seeing Corvold. Yeah. yeah, I am definitely seeing Corvold all over the place in this list. I did want to ask. So this is the classic. Like obviously you have Cat and Oven, and then you have the Anvil Mayhem Devil, and they're also playing Trail of Crumbs. Um, yeah. So I, and obviously we've been talking a lot about cats. So yes, sure. But the other day I was playing, I had the opportunity to blow up an artifact or enchantment. And I was looking at the three things that were on board. They had one oven, one anvil, and one trail of crumbs <laughs> with no cats. There was no cat on the board or in the yard. And I was thinking, what? Do I get rid of? I don't know. I need to get rid of something, but I wanted to ask you what what did in that situation, what do you think would be the most important to get rid of? That? Did they have Anvil going? Like were they No. Okay. So I... I think they didn't have any food or blood out. They were like it was just like those three permanents. And um I didn't see the combo in sight, so I was like 
do I go for, do I blow up the oven? Because that's the thing that I would be most worried about at this moment. But also I think they might have had two cards in hand. I was like, do I want them to get any dorky creature and then start drawing cards with Trail of Crumbs to get into the combo? And so I was like, I don't really know what oh, I should do. So none of them were online, basically. Like the oven doesn't yeah, have nothing cat, was... the, mm -hmm. There's no food to sack for the trail, and there's no mm -hmm. artifacts to sack for the trail. Artifact. That depend I think I'd be tempted to just get rid of Trail of Crumbs. It depends mm -hmm. on how you think you're going to lose. Like if you're at four life, obviously you probably have to get rid of the anvil. Um, mm -hmm. But... If you think you're going to lose by like getting out grinded, outvalued, it's got to be trail. That that card draws like so many cards, and they don't need to do that much to get it going. Like, mm -hmm. That's the one that's most snowbally if they find a gilded goose or something, you know. Yeah, that makes sense. But it's it's I definitely would... like the kind of thing where you're going to destroy one of them and, and you'll die to one of the other two, and you'll be like, ah, I should have killed that one. But there's no real way. I mean, I guess if you know that you've exiled all the cats out of their deck or something, like it changes the equation, right? But like, yeah, uh, but that was definitely. Yeah, I think that's one of yeah. those situations where you're 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 guessing, you're guessing what the top of their deck's going. <laughs> okay, good. That makes me feel quite a bit better because I was like, I don't know what to do, and I was like, you know what? I'm going to kill the anvil. I think that's what I did. Um, I can't remember if I won that game or not, but. Um, <laughs> I'm fairly positive I did not. That's when they uh, like, immediately <laughs> slam Gilded Goose. <laughs> yeah, into draw a card, into cat. And I'm like, great. <laughs> right. <laughs> Gilded <laughs> Goose, sack it, reveal cat, play cat. <laughs> um, Next thing, two turns later, you're at one and they have eight cards in hand. And <laughs> you're like, what have I done? But uh, you probably would have died faster if there was the anvil. Who there you go. knows? I want to call out the specific list we're looking at, though, because it has three Witches Oven and four Cauldron Familiar. <laughs> so, <laughs> just made the exact opposite decision of what we talked about the previous day. <laughs> I didn't even notice that. <laughs> That's funny. Because but again, Familiar is a little better here, right? Because you can sack it to other stuff, whereas the other deck only has ways to sack artifacts really it's hard to sack a that's true okay so uh because familiar you're gonna get more food so then familiar is more useful because there are more things that make food as right. opposed to the other deck where oven is the only thing that makes food okay mm -hmm. i was about to laugh more about it but you talked me down <laughs> and now i understand it makes um, some sense i think so. i think i would I, I still think it's wrong by the way but i, I understand why the decision was made yeah. So if you're going to play a sacrifice deck, are you going to play Rakdos or Jund? What are you going to what are you gonna do? I think I've been playing a lot of Rakdos early on in the format, and then I haven't played mm -hmm. any sacrifice. And just from what I'm playing against, I think I would play Jund. I think I would just play Corvold mm -hmm. Jund, honestly. I, yeah. I wouldn't be playing the Anvils. I wouldn't be playing Karn the Great Creator. And I'd do the more sort of traditional Corvold thing. I'd play four of both up and, and, and cat. And um, wait, you you will? <laughs> That's unheard of. <laughs> You're going <laughs> to... Four and four. Uh, but I'll play 61 four four. cards, though. I'm just adding in the fourth oven, you know, to this list. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, there you go. That's all you need. Um, no, I think you're right. I think playing Korvald is also the way I would want to go. Um, that usually, if I'm playing and someone, like, turn two is a trail of crumbs or something like that, or, you know, turn one goose. I'm like, oh, man. Um, right. I'm usually not happy about that situation. Uh, That's I, the best be test, residual. Right? Yeah, right. yeah, it's it's the test of, the grown test immediately. Like, oh, this is going to be oh, so annoying. No, oh, not oh. gilded goose. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, there's going to be a trail of crumbs. They're going to draw cards. So um, I do think that this is better. And when Corvold's going, you're like, oh, okay. GG. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, so... Yep. All right. There you have it. Jund better. <laughs> Jund is much better. All right. Yeah. Okay. So the other A tier. Yeah. Yeah. Bring us into the next A tier deck. All right. I really want to talk about. <laughs> there's one I want to save for the final A tier deck to let you talk about. Okay. So we're gonna sure. go with mono red aggro, which is, from what I hear, really sort of caught people by a lot of surprise this weekend. Apparently, it was just everywhere in the qualifier like just tons and tons yeah. of red. this is a deck that i wasn't i was thinking that it was just not 
doing it. Like we have seen it come up and, you know, the, the closest thing that we have seen really is, is historic, at least on arena. And it was a deck that was like kind of laughed at a year ago for pros bringing it to um, the league weekends and yeah. number of Martin music going <laughs> remember that. like not winning a single match playing yeah, that's a rough <laughs> So, um, I, since then I've kind of written it off being like, this is not the best. It's not, um, it, it's just there, but, um, but no, after this last weekend and hearing a lot more about it, it seems like this is, this is a deck that you got to watch out. They are going to snipe you. Um, yeah, so yeah, just this, this list that we're looking at it, just from clicking on the website, this is not the mono red that I think that everyone was playing this weekend. So this is like the mm -hmm. wizard's burn version yeah. here. What we're seeing a lot of on the ladder and in the tournament this past weekend. So I suspect by the time our viewers are clicking on this, they're looking at, at the deck that dominated this past weekend. Um, but it's the very traditional, like, uh, it's actually kind of a mishmash of all the best standard mono red decks in recent memory. So it's, it's got the annex, it's got the Ember Cleave mm. and the, yeah. Um, what's the dwarf's name? Tor, Torbran. Torbran. Yeah, it has that whole package from like when from that era of mono red, the very creature based Ember Cleave, you Torbran, mm -hmm. Annex Bone combo Crusher. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, but then it also has some stuff from like Ramunap Red. It has Ramunap Ruins and it has Hazarets. I think sometimes uh... on the sideboard, sometimes main deck. Um, mm -hmm. and like Hazaret with, uh, with Torbran is crazy. Now it's a little awkward Hazaret with Embercleave because you don't want too many cards in your hand for Hazaret to be able to attack. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, you just need the one Embercleave in your hand and it actually lets you discard extra like Embercleaves or whatever. And then you also have new cards that are like, like Kumano faces Kakazan, I think has shown itself yeah. to just be really, really good. Um, it's so good. <laughs> like this version, the version of the deck that took over this weekend is like so good. I don't even think it, I think it chooses not to play light up the stage because it just has more card quality. Wow. It doesn't need to. So, wow. It mostly plays that... like the old, if you ever played against the old Ember Cleave Torbrand thing, this deck is just like a, a really like, optimized version of that is what it feels like. Like you're just always getting, it used to be like, ah, maybe they don't have Ember Cleave and they often didn't. This just feels like you're always dead to something. So you have to, you really have to assume you're going to die on turn four. Jeez. Yeah. I remember I was playing against this recently. And like I was saying before, my love for uh, Colgon's command has been going up because that was basically mm -hmm. the play of like, hold it up. If they play it, you like let them attach, do all the stuff. You even block, and then you blow up the Ember Cleave and make them discard a card or shoot something else. Um, and that always felt yeah. very good. So, oh, um, yeah. they pretty much lose the game. Like if they if you don't win after that play, you had no hope of winning. So, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it feels it feels good. It feels good if you blow up the Ember Cleave. It feels really bad when you. Uh, when you see the annex come down and you aren't immediately doing Ember Cleave man or uh, math in your head, then right. uh, you're probably dead. If, if that's not what you're thinking, because um, that's usually what it means. And uh, it's fun to have it back. I like having mono red. Um, I like people being upset with mono red, so they stop being upset with mono white. That's what I like. I like when when. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like people are like, oh, those those fucking modern red players, they suck and they don't know how to play magic. It's the easiest deck in the world, blah blah blah, all that stuff. I like when it's directed at someone that's not modern yeah, white yeah. because I <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually like playing against mono red just because oh. it's so intense. It's like every decision is like you're sweating. Just like <laughs> every turn you live on like if you win, you win on like one or two life. You know? It's like yeah it's, I, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a fun time. I definitely Sometimes you agree. just get steamrolled. I, you, you don't know you're against mono red. You keep a land heavy hand and then you're like, oh, it was mono red. I guess I lose. <laughs> that yeah, you're like, oh, that sucks. Um, yeah. But no, I, I also agree that I like, I like playing against most every deck. 
there are, of course, choice few ones that I hate, but Mono Red is not one of those because uh, I know how it works. And, you know, if it's so easy to play, then you know how to beat it a lot better, shouldn't you, if you know the pattern? So anyway, right. um, uh, happy to see it around. But we do have one more deck before we go on a break. And uh, Jeff, you wanted me to talk about this one? Why is that? I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I think you're the only one with any experience in this uh, in this area. So. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> yeah, so we're talking about Mono Blue Spirits is also an A tier deck. Ah, yeah. Mm, love to see that. Mm. Um, <clears throat> this is one of my favorite decks. Uh, this list is close to what I've been playing, um, but it's been a <clears throat> it's been a minute since I've actually um, dusted this off. I was I was playing it a lot. Um, the, the like about two weeks ago, and then I this last week I haven't played much of it, but it's very close to what I was doing. Um, and yeah, this is just like you're doing a tempo, mono blue tempo stuff. You're flashing out your spirits um, and using specifically rattle chains to be able to flash in something, save one of your other creatures from a targeted removal spell, and then play all your spirits at flash speed, counter everything that tries to disrupt you, and win with flyers in the air. It is. Uh, just a great, just a great, great time. Um, I am wondering, so I don't think you, this, this deck is playing Snowlands and playing Faceless Haven, which oh, so nice to have Faceless Haven, not banned in standard. Yeah. Having it be an explorer is, ugh, I forgot how much I like this card. Um, but specifically the spirit that I've been, it's been the card I've been trying to figure out what to do with is Ascendant Spirit, which is the mm -hmm. Kaldheim Snow Spirit that I know you don't like very much. Um, have you, has that changed? I don't know. I remember you, you were saying how much you didn't like that when it came out. Um, do you still hate I, it? <laughs> I don't hate it because it's hard to hate something that like matters so little to you. You know, like, <laughs> it's just, it's just not a part of my life. When my opponents play this on turn one, I am generally happy because that means they're not end stepping the, uh, sailor. Mm -hmm. Like, what I don't want to see from this deck is turn one sailor on my end step, then untap curious obsession and spell pierce, mm. whatever I do. Now that's still possible if they're on the play with ascendant spirit, but it gets a lot harder, right? Like I might play a tap land or who knows on turn one, or they get to hold up spell pierce for my turn two or something and play the sailor. Like mm -hmm. this deck just has that dream draw of sailor untap obsession and then counter everything you do for the rest of the game um, yeah the amount of hands that is I a lot keep, like it happens yeah it does happen because the amount of hands i keep that is one snow-covered island the sailor and cures obsession hoping i will draw into my other ones is very high if you're on it's the very play, hard. i think you keep that for sure yeah you have to um me bringing up this this snow ascendant spirit is mainly because I also don't like it very much. I do not enjoy putting mana into something that will just get blown up, um, and it's very difficult because usually you're choosing between powering this up or playing rattle chains, and you need to do both. Um, right. It can win games, but uh, what it's really great for is soaking up removal that I don't care to counter. Um, right. Which is not really a good card in your deck if you're hoping to play it and then be like, you know what, it just dies. Um, yeah. That shouldn't be a card you play. Um, so I'm actively looking for other cards I can play instead of this. It's kind of like the Merfolk Wind Robber of the deck, where it feels yeah. like I have to play it, but I don't like it. Right, um, there's nothing better. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing really better, so I still play it. Um, but I'm never happy if it's going to be my turn one play. Usually, yeah, ugh. Right, like people yes, talk about that's... holding up the mana. Oh, it's good. With, you hold up counter spells. If they do nothing, you, you pump this. And it's like, that's so different than flashing in a creature, though, because, like, oh, my opponent pumps this on their end step. It's like, perfect. Now I fatal push it. Like, mm -hmm. okay, I just like, got one mana. My one mana fatal push traded with three of your mana now. And so yeah. it's like, yeah, I, I get that you can hold up counter spells and only pump this on their end step. But how much would you rather be playing a flash creature on their end step than putting more mana into this? Um, like yeah, you, you don't want to use mana on this in the early game, so you really want to only use it in the late game. The early game, you want to be countering stuff, you want to be playing stuff, and then this isn't necessarily a go super long 
deck. That's not how you win. Mm -hmm. So it just does, it's a fine card on power, I guess, but I've just never really seen it be good. Um, yeah. The, I've never the lost time to I was... this in games that no. I wouldn't have lost to any other one drop. I remember it being helpful, particularly in one game where I was playing against Mono White. So then they were trying to attack me with Thalia. And it's just, if I always had two mana open, I was like, you won't attack me. And gaining that much life was helpful. Um, just because they know I can, you know, block it and pump it. So I killed the Thalia, but it, it never felt actively good. It just felt like it was helping me for this very weird situation. Um, and so I agree. I think that yeah, it's just, it, it, if I ever win with this card, I was already winning and I just happened to win better or more. So right. um, I, don't, I don't think there was ever a situation where I was like, oh, sweet, I can finally pump this to its max level and then I attack in the air and they can't block. That's never... <laughs> never happens. Just never happens. Yeah. And just I feel like happens. this card got a lot worse with Wandering Emperor too because it's like, oh, on your end step, oh, I, I pump this and then it's like, okay, Planeswalker. <laughs> Planeswalker and exile. exile it. It's like, whoa, that is bad. I really should yeah. have tapped out on, on your end step. Oh, yeah, exactly. So you really need to make sure that you, if you're ever doing anything with this, like you literally can't have nothing else to do but pump it. Like if you can play a Rattle Chains, play that or any of your other And, and even then, sometimes bluffing a counter spell is better because your opponent won't play the Wandering Emperor if you're holding, if you're mono blue with three cards in hand that didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's so, no way they're playing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is probably a lot better for you. Anyway, um, this deck is super awesome. I'm glad that it's getting the what it deserves. It's a tier deck. It's a really good deck. Keep playing it. Uh, we need something that's not red <laughs> in the top five decks. So <laughs> having something to be fair, only some, blue. some people would put blue white control up here, but I'm guessing true. Like, it's just not popular enough on the ladder to be to be here. No. And hey, play mono blue tempo because you can still have a good fight against uh, Azorius Control, which is actually a bit more of the metagame than, um, than we're laying on to at this moment. Um, but anyway, Jeff, with that, do you want to go to a beer break and get some Jeff. more beer? I'm almost done. Okay. This beer break is brought to you by our patrons over on Patreon. That's right. You're already supporting the show just by being a listener. Watcher? But if you want to support the show even more... <laughs> Patreon's the best way to do that. And when you become a patron, you get an exclusive invite to our after party, which is a mini episode recorded immediately after this one, where we uh, ramble on about just some other non-magic things. Yeah. Plus, if you go to our Patreon and subscribe, you get to vote on your favorite co-host. The button to vote looks just like this. Oh, it's reversed. For those <laughs> reading at home, the button says, buy Jeff a beer. <laughs> or, you know, you could really just go and buy me a beer. <laughs> so go to patreon.com slash arena regulars to vote for me. Was, vote for me. Spoiled uh... by my camera inversion. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Uh, because it's our first time trying this, it might flip in the... Oh, yeah, maybe you know, you're maybe seeing it, it normal. Then... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> we'll, we'll have to find out. How about you tell us um, over on our Patreon? <laughs> <laughs> Or our Discord. Go to our Discord um, at Arena Regulars. All right, Jeff. We got another beer. We're ready for this one. You know, the tough part about being on video is after so many years of pretending to drink beer, you know, we, now we actually have to do it because people can see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jeff. Here we go. Let's crack these. And so this is. Great Lakes Brewing Company. It is their Miami Wise, which is a white pale ale that is 4.5%. Um, it's a joke on Miami Vice. Get it? Get, do you get it? No. Do you get the joke? I need you to explain it. Oh. I will not explain it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um Great. You know, uh, this one also has a serving temperature. It says between three to five degrees Celsius. So that sounds a lot more 
normal. See, that I can do. That I feel like if, if it's in my fridge, it's going to be, what, three, four degrees? Um, so that's plausible. The one that's yeah. at like 17 or 16, it's like, I need like a wine It cellar. was 14. 14, yeah. That's, it was 14. That's so unreasonable. <laughs> it's not even just like my basement, you know? That's, that's like I need a, a room where I can set the temperature of the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, well, anyway, let's cheers. Let's drink this and then get, 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 get it on. Perfect. Mm. Okay, Jeff, we had just finished talking about the A tier decks. So let's talk about some B and C tier ones as well. Some ones that we've seen on the ladder slash in events and a sweet deck we've been playing. That's right. Um, but let's, should we save that to the very end? I or think so. We, they, pr- probably. I mean, I think that's the most fun. Um, the one I want to talk about right now is, I'm sure, on a lot of people's lists. And it is playing two of the most played best colors in Explorer, which is Mardu Grease Fang. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Grease Fang, I know a lot of people are, okay, I, I, can, I can tell you're hating that this or hating this deck. Are really upset with it. I see a lot of people complaining about Grease Fang all of the time, um, and I don't understand why. It's such a cool deck. I, it was the thing I was most excited about when I saw it preview in uh, Kamigawa that Grease Fang could do the sweet thing with Parhelion too. Uh, I'm just happy that's continuing to do that and is uh, still pretty good. Yeah. So though. Well, go ahead. Give me your two cents. Oh, the way you said that, though, made me really want to hear what you're going to say. So uh, let's delay mm-hmm. it, though, for a second. I just wanted to to chime in and say that I'm pretty sure every single one of the people that hates Grease Fang, when they first saw the combo and thought that it wasn't going to be a good combo, thought it was awesome. But whenever a like mm-hmm. interaction like that actually enters its way into being playable, suddenly opinion of it goes from, oh, that's cool, to that's so lame it's funny it just happens like a mm-hmm. switch if the deck sucks then it's cool but if the deck and we're not talking like grease fang is the s tier deck of the format we're talking like it's a real deck yeah. that you should think about you know how you're going to play against it um now it's mm-hmm. lame right everybody hates it <laughs> it's just unbelievable to me it's like it's still a cool combo and if you want a combo deck this is what it should look like okay Graveyard Hate is good against it. Instant Speed Removal is good against it. Like, Hand Disruption is Even... good against it. Like... Mm-hmm. I guess like, Duress I, is I, not I saw, good against um... it. But like, you know. No. No, but like Thoughtseize, which is a card that's played in a lot of decks we've talked about tonight, mm-hmm. um, it it's a combo deck. If you take the pieces away from it, it can't really do anything. Um, what the thing I was going to say, the, but I was going to say is that, so I've played both the, the Mardu deck list and the Esper one. I originally was most interested in Esper and I continue to hold on to that, whether it's right or wrong. I still like playing Esper for this combo more than, um, this, this Mardu list. And, and Mardu is what we're mainly seeing and talking about. Um, now, whether that's, it's probably because Fable of the Mirror Breaker is a card um, that helps you discard cards. So that's good. It's also very, just a good card in general. Um, but uh, it's also <laughs> playing Blood Type Harvester. I know, I'm just discard about to, to, I just noticed that. I was like, son of a gun. Yeah. Poor Blood Type Harvester. So of lists I've seen online, uh, the, you know, the difference is, I mean, if you haven't played the deck, it's Grease Fang is the, the card that lets you take, you know, vehicles out of your graveyard. So you're playing a bunch of huge vehicles that uh, specifically Parhelion 2. So you could attack and get a bunch of Vigilance Angels, which are really strong, of course. Um, but the card that I like in this deck list that I don't see in the Esper ones, and I don't exactly know why, but I think it's really fun and good. And you could play it in Esper is actually Soar and Vengeful Bloodlord. Because uh, a lot of times in this deck, you will get into situations where, like, the combo doesn't kill people in one turn. 
like if you can get it off, you won't immediately kill them. You'll always be a little short unless they've played like a bunch of shock lands untapped and thought seized you and some other things, which usually means you can't you get the combo off in time. Blood Tide Harvester, hello. <laughs> <laughs> on your turn too. Um, but yeah, because most of the time you just can't get there. Um, so having a um, this Soren, this Planeswalker that not only can return a creature from your graveyard with three mana value, which is your Grease Fang it's, if it gets discarded. It comes back to the battlefield. You can combo off that turn, and Soren doesn't die, so all your creatures get lifelink. can be very helpful, because being able to gain all that life and having such a huge life swing has been a lot of fun. Now, I haven't actually tried it in Esper, and that's the next thing I want to try, is just like bringing it over instead of some of the Esper Planeswalkers are playing like um, Tezzeret and some stuff. Um, instead of it being like a discard outlet, I'd rather just have it help me get cards back. But um, that seems to be the most exciting thing. Though I still am not convinced that Mardu is the best build. I think I'm an Esper fan myself. Anyway, Jeff. Yeah, I was just going to, something that you touched on, like the other reason I'm okay with this being a good, like, you know, the combo deck of choice of the format is that the combo doesn't even win on the spot. Like, you win games mm -hmm. where your opponent combos off against you. That that happens to me. I've, you know, we've all done that if we've played it against this deck enough. And if you play Grease Fang, you'll lose games where you get your combo. Maybe not when you combo on, like, turn three. You probably win, like, 90-something mm -hmm. percent of those. But you can still combo off and lose. It's not so powerful that it wins the late game, right? So I'm totally yeah. fine with this deck. And I think people who complain, it's just like people like to complain. Um, they're going to complain about whatever's good. So um, why not this? <laughs> right? Why why not this? Yeah. Um, as for the Mardu versus Esper thing, I got to say when my opponents play like, is it otherworldly, whatever? <laughs> I'm just like, yes. <laughs> the card sucks, man. Like the to look at the top three and put some of them in your graveyard. I don't know why people are playing that, but I am. I would much rather my opponent plays that than plays Fable of the Mirror Breaker. Otherworldly Gaze, I think it's called. Oh. <clears throat> I don't even know what you're talking about. That's why I'm it's like, what literally are you a, saying? a blue instant um, that looks at three top three cards of your library and puts some oh. of them into your graveyard. Oh, that piece of crap from that was terrible in that draft <laughs> it format. It looks like it should say draw a card good. at the end. A lot of people assume it says draw a card at the end, but it doesn't say that. <laughs> no, it's just... Okay, no. Yes, that... <laughs> yeah, see, I definitely like Faithful Mending um, is a card that I've wanted to be good for a long time. Um, and then playing Thirst for Knowledge because obviously that... It's just perfect for what you're trying to do. I don't know. These cards, they just seem like... If I were playing, I would start me, with Mardu, I think. Fable is just too much to, to pass up on. It's like, obviously, one of the best cards in the format, but also perfect in this deck. So, Yeah, I mean, yes. It's just so hard, because I, I, I like having Spell Pierce. I just lean on it so much in other decks that I, it just makes me feel good when it's around. Mm -hmm. Um I I know that Mardu's more popular, and I just don't think it's... Maybe it's because people aren't used to playing against the Esper one, so maybe you can cheese out some wins, but... I think they just have different matchups, just... probably, right? Like, I yeah. think Blue-White probably never loses to the Mardu version. Whereas it, yeah. it would lose to Esper. Just a well-timed spell pierce will get the job done. Mm-hmm. Um, unless the Mario yeah. version, like, Thought Seizes, you know, first three turns are Thought Seize, Thought Seize, Thought Seize, Grease Fang, or whatever. <laughs> That's true. Thought Seize, um, Thought Seize, Thought Seize, me! Discard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> discard Parthelion. Is... Grease Fang. That's a real thing. Like, don't forget, you can yeah, do you, that. You can Thought Seize yourself. If you've never lost to somebody Thought Seizing yes. yourself, you can't even be mad. Like, they Thought Seize themselves, discard Parthelion, you're just like, oh. Oh no! <laughs> You're like, oh, what the? It's fuck? a really That's confusing not... experience because, um, like, they play Thoughtseize and then their hand gets revealed. And you're like, wait a minute! Oh yeah, no. <laughs> wait! Oh no! What the <laughs> fuck? Um, I was really happy because I was able to cheese out a game that was going 
very, very long. Uh, I was playing Mardu because I wanted to test it out if I liked it. Um, now, the cards that ended up getting me to the place that I was really excited weren't necessarily any of the red cards, so I still think you could do it um, in the in the blue version, but basically they had like uh, extracted all of my Grease Fangs from my deck uh, in some way. Uh, I can't remember exactly what, what the card was, but um, all I was <laughs> left with on the board was like, I guess technically I had a goblin token. Okay, so I had a goblin token from the, uh, the Fable of the Mirror Breaker, but um, I had been able to hard cast my Parhelion 2 while I also had unlicensed hearse on the battlefield. So what I was doing is exiling their graveyard, and then I used the goblin to crew the hearse to then crew Parhelion and then attack for the win. And they didn't see that line, and that was nice. That was a nice... <laughs> Goblin jumps in a car, then jumps into an airship, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, that was a lot of fun. I, uh, I, I like that. But overall, uh, I think this deck is sweet. And please try it. I don't know. Like, it's, it's the classic. If you think a deck sucks or you hate it and everything about it, play it. I mean, this one's a little bit harder because there is some wild card restrictions um, but hey, at least it's good. So yeah, and you like won't feel take, super bad. If you're losing to it, take a look at your deck. Make sure you're playing instant speed removal that can kill Grease Fang, because a lot of people mm -hmm. are playing like you know, Bone Crusher Giant. It's like sure, but that doesn't kill Grease Fang. So you need because the way it works is when they go to combat, Grease Fang's ability triggers. If you kill it in their main phase, it doesn't do anything. So that's why I say it's weak to instant speed removal. You just need to make sure the instant mm -hmm. speed removal you're playing can kill it. If you're relying on fatal pushes and you have no way to trigger revolt and you're relying on bone crusher giants, yeah, Grease Fang with three toughness is going to make, make you look a little silly. But if you just play like lightning strike or something, you know, anything that can kill it, um, like I know mono red over the weekend was playing, uh, Oh, I'm, not, I'm never going to remember the name of this card. It does four damage, two damage to one of your things and four damage to one of theirs. Um, I believe that card is Reckless Rage. Yes, Reckless Rage. They were playing that just to have an instant speed answer to Grease Fang. It's the best one mana red instant speed answer to Grease Fang. And they would like target their own... Uh, um, uh, Annex or something. Yeah, the the main one is the the prowess dude, the one two prowess because it doesn't die. Oh, um, soul scar mage, yeah. Yeah, and and like randomly, soul scar mage and reckless rage are just really good. It's like can get you through a bane slayer because it'll put four counters on it. Um, but yeah, so just if you're losing a lot, instead of just complaining that the combo is stupid, take a look at your removal suite. Maybe cut some of the cards that don't kill Grease Fang and just bring in cards that kill Grease Fang. Like, this is a, de a real deck that you should be preparing for. Mm -hmm. Like, you should have an answer to yeah. Grease Fang. I have seen online, people were saying that uh, someone was playing some janky deck that I would love because it's... <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was Illuminator Virtuoso, so oh, of course I'm God. looking at the deck. <laughs> And one of the cards the that they were playing cause, was... You, the Lost Cause, move on. <laughs> uh, they were playing that card. It's like um, you like you, you, uh, you see a guard or whatever from uh, AFR, the single blue mana that gives a creature hexproof, but the other thing it does is tap a creature mm -hmm. at instant speed. So you can also just tap it, tap their Grease Fang, they bring back Parhelion 2 and then just put it back in their hand, and then they have to figure out how to discard it again. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> That's a good the one. Hidden mode on the card. Yeah. <laughs> but I know um, I have... To uh, be fair. I have like... Oh my god. I'm, because we're on video, I'm just dying on card games today. But it's... Uh, <laughs> it's the card that exiles something from a graveyard for one black mana. And then it has escape. Yes. Um, well, yeah, I, I've also been playing that card. I can't remember what it's called and at it's, the moment I'm, either. I'm playing a bunch of um, those. Just, it's literally only in there for Grease Fang. Because they play Grease Fang, they target something, and I get rid of it. And I draw a card. It's like, it, it's a real way. Yeah. And um, that's also the thing, is that, like, we haven't been playing Phoenix since the ban, which I think, were they always even playing all expressive iterations that they could? It just seems like that deck is just gone. 
Yeah, I, I don't, think, I don't that, think I've played against. I don't know if the deck was ever that good. I guess, like, that's the, what you have to read into yeah. that. Maybe. I guess so. It always seemed like it was, uh, you know, up there. You know, at close to A tier. I would just when I thought about Explore, I was thinking, oh well, Phoenix is probably good, but maybe it just never was. I think it'll be that back great. when like Treasure Cruise makes its way onto Arena, but uh, that's true. Okay. Or at least, is it like Tempo decks will be back uh, when, yeah. when you get access to to draw three for one mana? Um, That's true. But for now, I think it's just missing a few key things. Um, like Pioneer also has... Okay, this isn't a card on Arena, so you'll have to spare me. Fi oh, Fiery Impulse. Yes. It's yes. like Shock, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it uh, does three if you have enough cards in your graveyard, basically. Um, mm -hmm. which we don't have, but that's, you know, very good for them in, over in Pioneer. So it's an interesting format explorer because as cards get released, you can sort of look to Pioneer and be like, oh, what do decks play this in can Pioneer? We build it? Gives you sort of a, an idea. Can we do it yet? Yeah. Which hopefully we will be getting uh, one of the anthologies sometime, which we yeah. were kind of promised we're supposed to be for Explorer. So it better be and just not... Imagine it's just historic. It's just more commander cards for alchemy and historic. <laughs> Classic. We added Edgar Markov. That's fun. <laughs> He's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, let's keep going through this list. Um, and uh, what is something that you want to talk about before we get to some spicy, spicy, fun stuff? Okay, so Grease Fang was, was B tier. Specifically, they have Mardu here, and they have, like, Esper way down, so I guess they disagree with you. But uh, I know. also in B tier, they have green-black X rigging. So the reason that we talked about green-black fight rigging last week, the reason there's an X there is some people have been playing Sultai. And when you play Sultai, you get uh, some random Kraken that's huge um, and fits right into the deck, but you also get... Like, people are playing the Sultai Ultimatum package. Uh, you get Emergent Ultimatum mm. to cast for free off your fight rigging, and then they're doing the whole, like, we have a Valky in our deck, we have a whatever. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of the way the deck that I've seen it evolve. The green-black version is basically the same as we talked about last week. Um, mm -hmm. I think I've come down, or not last week, last time we talked about Explorers, like, few weeks ago. Uh, I think I've come down since then on this deck. Not that I was super high on it at the time, but I thought, I think I thought it was good. And now I think it's like, okay. Um, it's just like, if you want to do the I, combo thing, I think Shakedown Heavy just sucks. Mm -hmm. Can we just, can we just talk about, it? I think Shakedown Heavy sucks. sucks. I play against this deck all the time. And I just am like so happy when they ramp into Shakedown Heavy. And I'm just like, all right, well, I'll take a hit from that thing. And then I will let you draw a few cards, and then what I'm doing is better than what you're doing, so it doesn't matter that you... Like, all your cards are so, so like, expensive. Yeah. It doesn't really matter that that you drew three extra cards, because the time it's, yeah. is going to make me win. The time I got off doing that. I guess I just like, have PTSD from literally just uh, Elder Gargaroths, or I just hate them. <laughs> <laughs> so anytime I see that card come down, it's so frustrating. And of course, oh no, yeah, this is for, for whatever reason. Every time I play against this deck, and I'm playing a deck that I play, I guess um, they they always draw their their shifting ceratops in their the other games, and I just can't. I was always playing against this with my um, when I was playing the tempo, mm -hmm. the mono blue tempo deck. And I just can't do anything to this fucking card. This unblockable five four, just like what the fuck. So that ended up being very frustrating. Um, so thanks for drawing that. But no, and I think, you know, originally I thought this deck was, it does seem really cool and fun. Um, but the more I've played against it, the more I'm like, ah, I don't really. Eh. It, it feels it's a just... bit like Grease Fang, where it, it, it's a, it can do this combo thing, but it feels like the combo is worse. Um, and yes. not as fast or reliable. And then I don't think mm -hmm. the plan B is enough better to justify doing this over Greedsang. Um, 
I would play Sultai, yeah, I think, yeah. because at least you win if you cast Emergent Ultimatum on turn three or four. Like, you win. You mm-hmm. don't just get another big creature, which is what the green black one does. Like I've won games mm-hmm. where my opponent goes on the play, they're like, Land of War Elf, turn two, shake down heavy, turn three, fight rigging, cast a free Gargaroth. I still have won those games when they turn three that because if it's not shake down heavy, I am not gonna win. Like if it's rotting register, but because it's shake down heavy, it's like mm-hmm. okay, kill your Gargaroth, you draw a card, you stabilize. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, that just feels like the combo's just not good enough. And so I that's why I think if you're going to play this, you should be playing the blue version, because then your combo mm-hmm. will win some amount of the time. Like, you still have to hit Emergent Ultimatum. But uh, you're still yeah. hitting, like, Tiddles, so you're still hitting All Runs Epiphanies. Like, on turn three or four, those will still win. So mm-hmm. I, I just, like, another big creature, even Titan of Industry, isn't an auto win on like, turn three or four. So... Okay, so do you like Titan of Industry? Do you not like Titan of Industry? I need to know. The people need to know, Jeff. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> okay. I know. I, I had a little foray into it. I thought, oh, okay, it's kind of cool to get it on turn three. But then I lost some games where I got it on turn three. I was like, all right, I was right. This card is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. I should never I'm doubt glad. myself. Titan of Industry. Titan of Industry is the worst. Good to know. Um, I do think it's the, the cute thing with Rotting Registor and Shakedown Heavy, if you have them on the battlefield together, it's kind of cute where you're drawing cards and then discarding them. Um, but overall, um, I still think Hideaway is just not always good enough. It's just pl- playing something for free and you don't always get what exactly you want. It's just kind of a thing. I don't know. And to be fair, they have this in B tier and I think that's fine. Like, B tier, mm-hmm. C tier, yes. it's going to maybe bounce around between there. I think some people have this in tier one, and that that's what I can't get behind. I think it could, it's still playing enough good cards to just be a fine deck, but like, yeah. I just don't think it's... I think they're just they're big dummies. It's not consistently doing good things enough. Um, yeah, I think it's they're doing they're doing big dumb stuff. Right, and it's just maybe like, it's just that know. I'm just I, I I think I'm down on it just because it's an emotional thing. I'm down on it because I just don't think it's nearly as cool anymore. It's not the hot deck as <laughs> like this exciting thing, and mm-hmm. so I'm like, Meh. so maybe I'm being like a dick <laughs> the way that we were talking about Grease Fang players. I no, I don't think that it's this hard deck for me to justify so it, it over Grease Fang right now. That's that's one. That's, yeah, that's the main thing, I guess. Yeah, if I'm playing some sort of big dumb combo deck. I want to play Grease Fang because it's just so much more fun to me. But hey, um, I, to be fair, haven't actually played the fight rigging deck. So maybe I should do that before I start uh, getting really down on it. I've but... just played against it a lot and I'm always kind of underwhelmed. Mm-hmm. I always like, I'm really scared because yeah. I know it's explosive and then it's not that bad. And I, and so that's like the feeling I get playing against it. I'm like, oh no, Land of War Elf, they're going to kill me. And then. They do their thing. And they and don't. I'm still in the game. Like I'm not saying I always win when they combo, or, or like I win half the time. Like if they combo in turn three, I'm probably losing most of those games. But I'm winning enough of them that it's making me question the validity of the deck. Yeah. There you go. Fight rigging. Um, <clears throat> perfect. Uh, we talked a bit about blue white control before. Uh, mm-hmm. This list has it at C tier. I'm skipping over uh, a deck um, for for the time being. Just wanting to talk about blue white control because it is something that you know we've been talking about a lot of different decks. We talk about combo. We've been talking about aggro and a bunch of like mid range stuff. But there is a control deck in the format, and I like we were saying before. Think that this deck is a, is actually a bit higher than what the list is telling us at this moment um, because it can do work and you need to remember that it's around because it's playing Wandering Emperor <laughs> and, and all the normal and stuff. And Teferi. Um, yeah. And Teferi, which is the the amount of times I've also been playing some of it, but like the amount of times that like you play Teferi and then people just concede, like mm-hmm. people just, if, if that hits the field, they know that they're dead. So they like immediately like save themselves some time and just stop playing. 
Yeah, um, and, which and is realistically, what I want them to do to very resolves, and you don't have an answer to it, you probably lose. <laughs> yeah, especially when you just don't have anything on the board, right? Or like, if you can immediately kill it, <clears throat> you're still like, uh, like you still got two for one, and but that's like the best case scenario mm-hmm. for you. If it resolves, you only get two for one. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, this list we're looking at in particular has four Fumigate. I've never once seen anyone cast Fumigate, but uh, I think yeah. I think people like differ on how exactly their list looks. But I know Gabriel Nassif's been playing a lot of this, so if you're interested, I would go check out his stream. And yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm going to trust someone on Blue Eye Control. It's going to be uh, <laughs> Nassif. Uh, so I would, that's yes. where I would start if I really wanted to play Blue Eye Control. I would just find his list and copy it. Um, but yeah, I think the deck has so many tools. Um, like March of Otherworldly Light, it's very good. Wandering Emperor and mm-hmm. Teferi, that's enough to win the game. I don't think you need to play more win cons than that. Um, like other than your yeah. lands. Uh, Memory Deluge, great card. Like there are just so many cards that are very, very good. Um, so it's nice to see Blue White at a really high power level, individual card power level, because sometimes that's where it loses is like... It just doesn't, its cards just aren't good enough. Uh, mm-hmm. And so it's, you know, like any control deck, if you can tune it against the meta properly, uh, then it's going to be good. I'm, I'm curious about how this beats, like whether this beats red black or not consistently. Mm-hmm. I think maybe you have to build it to do that. Uh, maybe that's why, yeah, I don't know. Like their cyborg plan is like rest in peace, I guess. Um, if there's any cat shenanigans, but like, I just, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm a little, I, yeah, it doesn't, this particular list yeah. we're looking at, I don't think beats red, black. I'm sure like Gabe, Gabe's list will have, you know, he, he knows red, black is, is a big part of the format. So he'll have some uh, answers to it. I think I've seen people play like uh dream trawler as a way to beat red, black, um, oh. which to be fair, I don't that know is... how Red Black beats that card. So. <laughs> yeah, it probably can't. Um, the one, as always, if you're ever playing, if you like are playing against this deck, um, the best rule of thumb, if you're not used to playing against this, is play as if they have sensor in their hand all the time. They, because they you always are have sensor in their hand. Always. They have sensor. Yeah. Yes. Even if they cycle one, they have another one. Just. You know, just play around sensor uh, as much as you can because it—that's what makes you really tilted. You can play <laughs> against the deck fairly well if you don't get censored on turn two or three. Just don't let them do that, and then you'll be oh, you'll I, feel a lot better. Whether you win or not, I don't know, but like you'll feel a lot better about your life. I think the most tilting thing is getting censored on like turn eight when you had a land in hand and you just didn't play it. <laughs> yeah, and the amount of times you see that in the pro tour, and they're like. Oops, oh. you know, and then they play the land. Because uh, you're thinking, like, you know, obviously we're playing with shock lands. So you're like, do I want to shock this out? No, I, I'll just play it tapped later. And then you get got by sense. So you're like, nope, I should have. Because ah, <laughs> you're thinking about so many things against the stack, right? You're like, oh, they could have Wandering Emperor. Mm-hmm. They could have Shark Typhoon. Maybe they have Holding Up Memory Deluge. Um, you know, what if they untap and slam to Fairy? And then you just get got by sensor. That's what happens. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's more of a, I mean, whether it's really important in your game plan, obviously you don't want to get your spells countered. I, this is just an emotional thing. You <laughs> will feel better if you don't get got by sensor. Yeah. So sometimes it's right to play I, into sensor, works. but like it's right in terms of, you know, strategic win percentage. It's not right in terms of how you feel no, in your life. Always hurts. Yeah. Always. So yeah. that's how I deal with this deck. But blue white, I think, is good. I'd expect to see it, especially as you move up. Like if you're in lower tiers, you might see less blue white. But players in higher tiers tend to like blue white control uh, more than mm-hmm. players in lower tiers. So just be cognizant when you you might hit that wall where you just start to run into a lot more blue white, and then you'll have to think back and be like, "What have they told me not to do? Oh yeah, get censored on turn two. Pass." Yeah. <laughs> yes. That is, that's our main thing. 
Uh, Jeff, is there another deck you want to talk about before we get into the spicy brew? No, I think let's, uh, let's move on to what uh, you and I have both been playing, actually. Yeah, we've been alluding to it the whole episode. Yeah. The, um, the big I mainly get to talk it up. <laughs> I get to talk it up a lot because I wasn't the one that built it. It was Jeff, um, which is always just so much fun. And uh, so, yeah, Jeff, do you want to tell us about your, your deck? All right. Well, it all started long, long ago. <laughs> um, so <laughs> I was on the hunt for the best Omnath deck, okay? Because Omnath in its original form, in its original glory, is legal in this format. So I played a bunch of stuff. I played the Elementals deck that you might run into sometimes. Um, I thought that was pretty bad. I played Omnath Adventures. I basically took like Austin Bursevich's championship deck and tried to update it. Um, that was also pretty bad. I felt like, like I think there was room to to work with it, but yeah, it just felt like yeah, you don't get enough side, you don't get enough flex slots because of all the adventurous creatures you have to play. Anyways, mm -hmm. eventually I stumbled upon the deck that we are playing, which is five color Niv Mizzet. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Um, you may have heard of this. Like it, it's kind of pop, peaked its head into a uh, historic a couple of times. Um, but I think I actually think it's good in Explorer, and more importantly, it's super duper fun. <laughs> yes, that is the biggest thing. Um, but Jeff, before we get into it, you should reveal the name. Obviously. <laughs> All right. So I've been calling it Omnivore. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the reason because the reason is that it was a mish a mashup of uh, Omnath. Am I going to play Omnath? Am I going to play Niv? Or yeah, I don't really have anything. Else, I don't know. So those, are, those are the things I'm going to play. <laughs> really, you're just waiting for a multicolored card that is O R E something. That's right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But anyway, I have to, I just have to say I love the name and the deck is uh, lots of fun. Um, and I think you're right. I think Omnath in this makes a lot of sense because the amount of times that actually no, go into the deck a little bit and then I'll talk about how it plays. But um, yeah, go, so, go ahead. so for people that haven't played or seen the deck at all, basically Niv Mizzet is like the reborn reborn one. Um, yes. It's one of each color. It's a 6-6 six, six flyer. And when it enters the battlefield, you look at 10 cards and get to put one, exactly one from each color pair. So blue, black, green, white, whatever. You get one card from each and put them into your hand. So the way the deck works is you just play, you're like all gold cards and you play like as many two color in particular cards from across all the guilds uh, as much as you can to make this card as good as possible and so what niv mizzet ends up being in the deck is like a six six flyer draw five something like that like you, you can mm -hmm. usually expect at least three <laughs> if you hit less than three you're you're pretty unlucky uh but you i've i've gone up to like eight and then had to discard like four cards on end step because i was like whoa i was expecting wow. to hit so many fewer cards than that um Jeez. And I have had the pleasure of whiffing on it, which was... My opponent gave me a, a nice on that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. That's and, so and rough. If your opponent whiffs on it, by the way, you might not know this, but you're actually... You must take cards. So it's not even just a click too fast kind of thing. If there were guild cards in the top 10, you must take them. So uh, if they whiff, they hit nothing. <laughs> Uh, I think I hit, like, six lands and, like, three Omnaths and another niv Mizzet. And I was like, oh, cool. All my Omnaths are now at the bottom of the pack. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> but that's so rough. Ouch. Yikes. But in building this deck, you just get to go through and pick all of your favorite cards. So, like, from all the guilds. So I'm playing my blue-whites are Teferis, of course. Hero of Dominaria. Mm -hmm. We talked about Colagon's Command a lot. Got some Colagon's Command as my red-blacks. Um, I have a Clothis in there because, you know, nice. That's, I wanted to get a green-red card mm -hmm. in, and that one seemed like the, the, the general purpose card to go for. Playing a lot of, like, early game stuff. So Assassin's Trophies, you're kind of hits everything as green-black. 
um, really like Vanishing Verse is good against a lot of stuff. There's your white black. And so that's kind of the fun of the deck in building it is you get to tune it and choose your like favorite gold cards, uh, which let's be yeah. honest, everyone loves gold cards. So yeah. And you only lose to your I mana think... like half the time. <laughs> only half the time. Like I, I, <laughs> that is the thing that happens most often where I'm like, sick, look at this growth spiral. I'm into that. Oh, I don't have any blue. Okay. I have to ship this. Hand. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next one. Oh, okay. So, well, hopefully by turn four, I can play Omnath, I guess. <laughs> that will be my play. Gro but Growth Spiral is an important it, it, one to bring up. That's probably the most important card in the deck. So you you really want land, yeah. two lands, three lands, Growth Spiral, and Omnath kind of. That's what you're looking for. Tends, tends to be the thing. But you're also pay playing the companion Gigantha, uh -huh. which is perfect for this deck. Because if you leave it on the battlefield, you just get to play Niv Mizzet Reborn for free. Yes. And then cast all the stuff. It's just gravy after that. You can cast all the things you just took. And um, most of the mana base is just one of all of the cards, except for Fabled Passage. Um, but uh, <clears throat> Which I've moved up Fabled to four, Passage by and... I was just like, why am I not? I'm adding okay. four of these. Okay. I was wondering, but I thought, you know, if Jeff says three, I'm going to put three. Um, there may have been a couple things, so I have to continue talking to Jeff about what he's changed, and I basically just take whatever he says, because that is my favorite thing, is to have somebody else build decks, and then I just play them. Um, but feel free to test a card uh, and let is... me know. Right now, I, I slammed in a, a Scarab God just to see how that works, because I was like, you know what? This can, like, reanimate an Omnath or a niv visit from the graveyard, so... Um... We're, uh, that sounds pretty fun. We're down a Teferi and yeah, still... Scarab God at the moment. Okay, okay. That sounds like a lot <laughs> of fun. Because I have been drawing a couple extra Teferis, and I'm like, I don't need more. Um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> I already have one on the battlefield. Yeah, I'm, I already won the game. Out. I just resolved a Teferi. What am I doing with all these extra Teferis? Yeah. yeah. Um, but honestly, of a lot of the cards, Knight of Autumn, the Celestial <laughs> one... This card has been amazing. I threw it this in as like, card a, I, I need a green-white card in the main deck. So I put in one Knight of Autumn, and it's just like so many games. and like, oh, if I draw a Knight of Autumn, I can win this game. <laughs> yeah, that was the card that I was talking about earlier when I said I had to choose between uh, the right. artifacts or enchantments because yeah. that is the mode you use most of the time because it is the thing that you need to do for the best decks are always playing these artifacts and enchantments. So you got to blow up. Um, even if you're dealing with fight rigging, you can blow up their fight rigging, things like that. So having that flexibility from that card, I I just always enjoy it. You know, when this first came out, I was always thinking like, oh, plus one, plus one counters are the best, but really mm -hmm. destroying artifacts and jammers right out in this meta is And, and with Mono awesome. Red, like honestly, a 2-1 that gains you for life has been... Or in the, if you yeah. draw it later, it blows up Embercleave, but like earlier it... Or Anax blows up Anax, but it's like earlier it's just like, 2-1, gains me 4 life. It's really good against Mono Red. Yeah, I, I was playing... there. We didn't talk about it, but there's like a Humans deck that does like Coco stuff, and it's kind of like Mono White, essentially, but with Coco. Mm -hmm. um, and um, just being able to like play this and uh, gain 4 life and then have a 2-1 that's going to trade with whatever, I'm like, amazing. Right. That's exactly what I needed right now. And it only costs 3 mana. Mm, beautiful. Love it. Um... It's not it that good tons against of fun. black mid range though. It's just like a four three or a two one that gains you four life, uh, or you blow up like uh, one of their all important blood tokens, I suppose. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, I but guess hey, you know it's only one fable. of the cards that's in your deck, nice. so that's true. But like most of the time, I'm not even playing. Like I have other things I'm doing, so. Um... That's fine. Maybe I'll just take that turn to ramp or, or whatever. Um, so it's never happened. But I just... in, in theory, playing a 2-1 that blows up the Fable and then can trade with the 2-2 two -two Goblin Shaman is, like, fine, right? Because <laughs> it does everything that you cleanly took care of Fable You're with one card. You're just down a treasure token. Like, that's pretty good. Most things get they smoked by Fable it. in terms of, like, <laughs> how much you have card to advantage. trade for. That's true. That is true. Um... But in any case, uh, this has been a ton of fun. And of course, the card that I always put in, like I, I tend to find myself playing against blue eye control a lot with this deck and having uh, four Dovin's really Vito's in the sideboard. It is a lot of fun. Uh, but Dovin's Veto is 
so fantastic that yeah. having a deck that actively wants that card specifically because it's gold is awesome. And because you know, they already love it, uh, playing like aggressive Azorius decks and having that tool against control decks. So it's a ton of fun. And when it goes off, it goes off. <laughs> yeah. So it, there's nothing better um, than like the old Omnath Fabled Passage Nif Mizzet or Omnath Fabled Passage to Fairy. <laughs> The best thing, like, I love having the Fable Passages to hide certain cards from people because they're not expecting it. Or just the classic, you know, play Fable, you know, you have, um, um, you play Omnath, play a Fable Passage, and then go fetch up a Black Source. And then when that enters the battlefield, then you get the mana to play the visit maze. It's crazy, yeah. Sometimes it's you've so, already drawn the Swamp uh, or something, like it's in your hand, and you're like, ah, now I have to play yeah. Teferi for it instead of uh, the Nip Nip. But the sweet, yeah. The, the control matchup play, but... is super fun because it's often like, do you have more counter spells than I have must counter threats? Let's find out mm -hmm. because I have five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> anyway, it also kind of made me come around on Assassin's Trophy, which is a card I wasn't playing much when it was around. Well, people are ever. skimping on basics, so uh, it's mm -hmm. even better than... Like, in this deck, I think it's, it's necessary because... You need to be able to kill anything. Like it's, yeah. I'm always holding it back for a Teferi or something that uh, Vanishing Burst doesn't yes. hit. But it also mm -hmm. hits lands. I think a lot of people don't realize that it hits lands, so it can kill. Like, I, I love when my opponent goes to animate um, the uh, Hall of Hall Storm of Giants. Storm and Giants before it, before gets it has ward. ward. Yeah, you blow it up. <laughs> yeah, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I love that. I love that. Yeah, that's so good. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, this has just been a, a sweet deck. It definitely costs some wild cards, but if you have your mana base and a lot of the cards that have been out, um, you should check it out. Um, and the place to check it out is our discord channel. So you may have heard us talk about this early in the episode, but you should come join because it's a lot of fun. We're just chatting with some folks. So find us, uh, at arena regulars on discord. Join the channel, and uh, you can get deck lists that Jeff makes, and I talk about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I need to post the updated one because I think I've moved one Dovin's Veto main deck actually because I just liked having a counter spell. In the Ooh, main. Um, it's so good. Yeah. So before we go to the last call, I just want to talk tell a little story about this deck. So um, okay, here we go. Yeah. All right. So basically, this past weekend was the qualifier event as we sort of alluded mm -hmm. to and on friday you get to try to qualify for the qualifier so it's the qualifier play in now i didn't play in the best of one version because originally i was supposed to some friends of mine were supposed to be visiting this weekend but they ended up canceling so then on friday i played in the play in event and mm -hmm. i went i was you know I'll spare you the first three matches i went 3-0 with this deck and then I got paired against, uh, I think it was like Jeskai Control, actually. It was like the Gear Hulk Magma Opus Jeskai oh. version. Anyways, I think we're pretty favored against Control in general, um, especially post-board when, when all four Dovin's Vetoes are in there and we got Thought Seizes and Mystical Disputes. But uh, we're, we split a game, right? So it's literally game three. If I win this, then I qualify, I'm in the qualifier. And we were playing this really long game, but basically the gist of it is I accomplished what I wanted to do, which was resolve a niv mizzet and draw like six cards. And then my opponent has two cards in hand. I have a 6-6 six, six flyer and a full hand. Usually this is, it's usually enough to win. One weakness <laughs> of our deck is that it is very, a little bit light on win conditions because because of our mana base, we can't play any, like, lands that can win the game. So we do need to win the game with our creatures. And uh, basically, what, the way, what this game turned into was, am I going to kill them before I deck? Because all of my creatures draw me extra cards. And uh, oh, no. they are just, like, answering creatures one for one. I have to play another creature to win, but my creatures always draw me extra cards. Uh, so we get it. We both identified that this is how the game is going to end. Either I'm going to deck or they're going to die. 
And my opponent's just like top deck. Okay, they top deck Magma Opus. They tap all my creatures. They make a 4-4. Four, four. Like, oh, okay, fine. I deal with, I deal with all that because I have full hand. And it's not getting any less full. Everything I play re- replenishes my mm-hmm. hand. I have like a Teferi that I'm just not using. The Teferi is just sitting there, not being used, because uh, like that's how low I am. Gonna... That the, even mm-hmm. like you think you want to get to the ultimate, but I don't have enough cards to make the ultimate good left in my deck. So I'm just <laughs> saving it for the minus three. <laughs> Anyways, eventually, mm-hmm. and then, then next turn they have Gear Hulk. Flashback that Magma Opus they top deck last turn. Tap two more things. Anyways, I get it down. Giganta is my hero on the battlefield. My my lone remaining soldier that I played because he does not draw me a card, and I have no cards left in my deck. And okay, so let me see if I can remember this exactly. My opponent has a card in hand, and they top deck one more card, and that top deck was. Um, well, I don't know which one they drew, obviously, but the card they played was the card that uh, sunset something. It makes two one ones and gains them four life, and that that gained them four life put them to um, what was it? It put them to three. No, that's not possible. How much does it gain them four? No. Oh, but I had Clo- I had Clothis. Okay, so it put them to five, but they were okay. about to go to three because of Clothis. Mm-hmm. And it made two one ones, and I was like, "Wow, that's got to be like their best possible draw." I have one more draw step left, right? So mm-hmm. I come to my turn, I draw my card. Luckily, I have Deafening Clarion, so I can kill both one ones. The Clothus puts them down to three. I kill both one ones. I attack with my five five. I win the game. So I cast Deafening Clarion. Out of their hand comes Absorb. So that puts them up. The six, <sighs> and I had another Deafening Clarion to kill the two one ones, but I'm only able to attack them down to one. <laughs> oh my! It was literally God. like their two cards exactly put them to one against my hand, and I had literally zero cards left in library. Like that was my last turn, <laughs> and I was like, Please you know what? Tell me. <laughs> to, to end the game, you did plus your Teferi after that. And... <laughs> oh, yeah, I drew my own card. There was, I had like a million. I think I played an Omnath or something. But like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty funny. I'm sure I could have won the game if I'd like identified earlier that I needed to stop drawing cards. Um, but Dang. I think back to that. I was like, you know what? If you're not going to make it, that's how I want to not make it. And I also really, really hope that my opponent was 3-0, and and that was their mm-hmm. win and in. Because now they have the reverse story of me, this, like, awesome yeah. story of how they got in. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's crazy. Oh, man, that's <laughs> awesome. Oh, I mean, Bum, yeah, obviously I'm sad that you didn't actually make it into the uh, the qualifier. But... <laughs> I was, what a good story. I was so sure I was going to win that game. And then I started to like, maybe I'm not going to win this game. i got to be careful. Uh, <laughs> and then the yeah, sunset. Yeah. Sun, I don't even know what, the, I, I don't even know why that card was in their deck against me. It's not generally good against me, but in that situation, boy, was it exactly what they needed. Cause yeah. the, the seven life with absorb and that was exactly <laughs> enough to, uh, cause I guess they were at one. That's before, so upsetting. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's see. It's um, it's uh, yeah, sunset revelry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, damn. But they anyway, were a Yorion deck, I guess. Um, so they probably just couldn't take everything out. <laughs> that's that's true. They just need more cards. <laughs> um, anyway, Jeff, let's move on to last call. Mm-hmm. Um, as always, uh, we are rating our beers on a scale of bronze to mythic, just like the tiers in arena. <laughs> Isn't that funny? And um, we're never talking about what tier you are in currently. We're just talking about uh, rating beers because it's fun. And having a tier system like this is just it's just nice. So don't feel bad that we are going to say that bronze beers are trash. They're horrible. You can't even finish them. You have to throw them away. Silver beers are beers that don't have a lot going on. Essentially macro brews or equivalent. Yeah, gold beers are fine, but you probably won't really drink them again or really think about them ever again. Platinum beers, one step up from that. They're super solid. You would drink them fairly often. 
Diamond beers are exceptional. You really like them, and you recommend them to your friends. At Mythic, this is the best of the best. You will not stop talking about them. That's right. All right. We have two beers here. Um, do you have your beer chosen? I'm holding both of them in my hand right now. I think I know which one I liked. Um, are you ready? Yes. All right. Here you go. Three, two, one. Miami Vice. Miami Weiss. Yeah, that's right. Is it Vice? Miami Vice? I say this as like a German W with a V. But uh... All right. So that does make a lot more sense than what I said earlier. Perfect. <laughs> so it will be Miami Vice. I think that is perfect. Um, you should have introduced this beer then. Damn. It can be looked bad. Um, anyway. You did so this call is the one the we're Miami doing... Vice pun, so... At least we got that. I, well, that's true. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was obvious, but it's even more obvious the way that you say it. So um, it is the White Pale Ale uh, from Great Lakes Brewing Company. Um, it looks nice. Anyway, let's talk about it, Jeff. This beer. Yes. Um, I yeah. still have a little bit left, so I got to taste it. Hmm. Give us your... Okay, I'll, I'll start. So... Um, I think it's nice, you know, uh, it's, it's, there's nothing going on that is too, I don't know, aggressive. Um, it seemed very cool, just like the colors in it. And, um, yeah, it kind of felt like a pale ale. Um, I don't have too much of, of any sort of wheat, which is great, uh, for me. That's not what I'm looking for. Um, so I don't know if the, the play on it really, really works into that sense, but, um, I know. <laughs> I, 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 it tasted like a nice, chill pale ale that was um, a little bit lighter and happy to be drinking some beers that aren't so heavy this week. So, um, so yeah, what about you? Yes, same. So I didn't really read it thoroughly, I guess. I didn't know it was a white pale ale. I just heard Miami Vice mm -hmm. and assumed it was a wheat beer. Um, and then it is, like you said, it's, it's sort of like a pale ale with wheat, wheat beer notes rather than... Mm -hmm. uh, like a wheat beer. And so I was pleasantly surprised because like you, like I, I like wheat beers. Okay. But not too much. Like I'll have one. Maybe. Yeah. Um, and I really like white pale ales. Actually. I think, I think that takes all of the good things about wheat beer and then merges it with good things about pale ale, which is like the fuller body. So I, I'm a fan of this style. Um, that being said, this is, this is pretty good, but it's, you know, like you said, it's not, um, it, it's not like doing yeah. anything that blows my mind. Crazy. It's super creative or mm -hmm. whatever. It's just like a good example of, uh, of a, of a white pale ale. Yeah. Well, okay. So I didn't read the can because I don't read cards or words. Yeah. We don't, um, we don't but it does yeah. on the back. It specifically says, okay, we're busted. We're calling this a Weiss and it's not, or a Weiss, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, they just said it's an American style uh, that's a take on a German wheat beer. So it's a pale wheat, but uh, it's really, it's not that at all. It was just something the marketing team came up with. So um, <laughs> there you go. I love that. That is the... <laughs> they also say they've <laughs> they never been to, to Miami. <laughs> Perfect. There you go. Um, but this feels um, good. I don't know, Jeff, where are you going to put this? I think this is is pretty good platinum for me. I think. Yeah, I'm going to yeah. give it. I'm going to give it platinum. I think it's low platinum. I'm, I'm not in love with it, but uh, I would have it's, this. Um, I would probably. I would have it again. I don't know if I would get it again, like buy it, but yeah. like, um, if I saw it, I might. Maybe if I wanted to make a joke, I would use the name to joke about something. <laughs> but anyway, marketing um, team wins again. <laughs> marketing team always love that. Um, Ruby Social, this guy you brought, the Strawberry Rhubarb Wit Beer. Mm -hmm. um, it was okay. I think my <laughs> favorite was, uh... thing about this beer is that it has like mm -hmm. a beer profile and uh, experience on the can. I like when they yes. include these. So it says not too hoppy. This thing. It's tart. Yeah. But then the experience, it says you want this on a summer patio. You can, you can mm. pair it with favorite spicy Asian dishes or you can listen to uh, classics and standards while you drink it. I, I particularly uh, like when they go a little crazy with that experience section and suggest like 
outlandish, make outlandish suggestions. <laughs> Whereas this is mm -hmm. like more serious, but I, I just like the, the, those little, I think that gives me more uh, character of the beer or of the brewer than yeah. like a little blurb yeah. about it. So I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. um, as for the beer itself, it's, it's fine. I don't know. It was, yeah. yeah. It, it had some sweetness from like the strawberry rhubarb, I guess. And, I guess, I guess. Yeah. Um, this is gold, low ish gold. Yeah. This is like maybe. undisputably gold. I think it's just, it's fine. Yeah. I probably won't drink this again. It's fine. I like that it was brewed in PEI. I don't think, I don't know if I've ever like knowingly drank something from PEI before now. Okay. That's nice. I, um, I should read the cans more because I definitely didn't look at either of those things beforehand, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I would probably drink some of their stuff. I would try more things. Mm -hmm. Um, but this wacky, crazy beer, uh, was, uh, not super wacky. It was, uh, it was okay. Yeah. Um, all right. Anyway, those are our ratings for this evening and for the end of our first video podcast. We do. It's a milestone. Um, it's a milestone. We're just racking those in. Um, so it is now time for closing time. You can always reach us at Arena Regulars on Twitter and Instagram, as well as Discord and YouTube. Yeah, you might see us on MTG Arena itself. Our username is Arena Regulars Podcast. If you see us, give us a nice, give us an oops, maybe even a sticker. Yeah. Uh, you can find me personally at Zulberg, that is Z-E-U-L-B-E-R-G on Twitter and Instagram. But Jeff, where can they find you? Uh, I have Twitter. It's at Bluesbrews MTG, B-L-U-E-S-B-R-E-W-S MTG. And please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts on Spy Tunes on iTunes. Uh, follow us on Spotify. Uh, leave us a review there as well. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel where you're watching this right now. Leave a comment and tell us what you thought um, or just any questions that you had. And, of course, we've said it a million times already, but join our Discord. Um, we would love to have all of you a part of that community because if you're listening to this and you're this far into the episode, you're probably pretty chill. So we like you. This has been the Arena Regulars. Reminding you that getting your turn to play censored feels real bad. So the way to avoid that, take those Blood Tithe Harvesters out of your deck. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. All right, that's fine.